Well, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. This morning, I've entitled my message, How Then Shall We Live? It fascinates me and puzzles me, troubles me. Um, sometimes I get encouraged. And you haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. I'm talking like a woman right now. <laughs> Thank you. More men support, please. Now, I know you shouldn't say nothing, men, because you'll get it later, but... Uh... So sometimes I'm troubled, and sometimes I'm puzzled, and sometimes I'm encouraged, and... What I'm talking about... And I know you can't read my mind, so let me help you. Anyway, foolishness aside. Jesus completed his work almost 2,000 years ago. Almost. We say 2,000 and that's fine. Uh, it's pretty close. That was way back then and we are way over here now. And uh, I can hear my ears ringing again. And... Uh, And I honestly think it's difficult to keep a true perspective of what it was meant to be and how it was meant to be. Not that we're not doing our best and trying hard and probably many have it figured out really well and by many I would include churches in that phrase as well, not just individual Christians, but, but, but as a whole, when you look over the landscape of Christianity, I puzzle sometimes, do we have the true picture of what it was meant to be like in the beginning? And, and the measure of success that they had in those first centuries how they took over the world, the, the known world, the Roman Empire. Like, like how was that accomplished? And, and so when I look over the landscape of Christianity, I'm puzzled, I question, I'm troubled. Um, sometimes I'm encouraged. How then shall we live? My focus this morning is on unity. And, and I want to draw attention to it and, and try to explain uh, how to navigate, how to live, how, how to draw attention to this seemingly insignificant aspect of life? And is it insignificant? So let's begin with the scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, let's read verses 1 to 6. Oh, you know, I just want to do it the old style way. I believe in the book, the Bible book. It's great to have it on your phone or wherever you've got it. I think one day we're going to realize, wow, the Bible in a book, isn't that a clever idea? We should go buy one of those. This is how the West was won. Western civilization. <laughs> So let's read it together. I, I invite you to read together. And if you've got one of those old-fashioned books, 
I hear a page or two rustling. There was a day, there was lots of rustling on a Sunday morning with the book. So let's read together. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy. Oh, you guys read quiet, my goodness. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. For there is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called into one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The focus here, well, there's several, but I think the key focus here is unity. First of all, is unity in and of itself a good thing? And you're probably going to say yes. And I'm going to say no. Unity in and of itself is not necessarily a good thing. When a pack of wolves is unified, it might not be a good thing. When a communist government is unified, it might not be a good thing. In a war situation, when one country is unified against another country, when a church denomination forsakes biblical values and adopts a worldly agenda, worldly agenda, and they're unified in that effort, that's not a good thing. Unity can be good or it can be bad. There is an aspect of unity, biblical unity, when it comes from the council of heaven, when that unity is employed, it's an amazing good thing. It has vast, vast ability to accomplish the unimaginable, unimaginable. And that's how Christianity spread so rapidly in those first centuries. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, I like how the King James translates this. And this intrigues me. Why was this such a big deal that it was noteworthy? On the day of Pentecost, they were assembled together in one accord. So this is 10 days after Jesus had ascended, and he said to them, wait, go there and wait. There, there was something very unique about those 10 days that it, somehow it caught the attention that they were in one accord. Let's draw a parallel from the world of music. In the world of music, there is what is called a chord. A chord, and probably Anne could explain this better than me. A chord typically is made up of three foundational tones, notes, and other notes are built on that. These three notes, typically three, it can be two, typically three, they have to harmonize. 
How many chords are there? Do you know, Andrea? Would you guess? Make a guess. 50. Trace, how many chords are there? Quickly. Twelve. Four thousand. Four thousand seventeen. Four thousand seventeen possible chords. All of these chords have a name. So what is very unique is that an instrument, like a piano or a guitar, that instrument has to be in tune to itself. And then out of that multiplicity of possibility, that sounded eloquent, these, these notes have to harmonize with each other, out of which you're going to build a chord, and then other notes could harmonize with those notes. There are very few instruments that are possible of creating a chord. There are more than 1,500 musical instruments in the world, and only few of them can produce a chord. I mean, you have woodwind instruments, you have brass, you have stringed instruments, and out of that stringed instruments, one like a guitar or a piano, you can play a chord on those instruments. Huh, what have I not said? <coughs> so when a chord is played, something unusual happens. When a string is plucked, it, it makes a sound. When you take several strings and you pluck them, and these strings have to harmonize, you create a harmony with these strings, you pluck them, and, and perhaps other strings as well that harmonize with those three bass strings, you, something unusual happens. You create a sound that is unusual. Hallelujah. If more than one instrument is being played at a time, hence this morning, if there was 50 instruments up here playing, all those instruments have to be in tune with one another. If a guitar plays a C chord and the piano plays a C chord, if they're in tune, they will harmonize. If there was 50 instruments up here, all of the instruments would be in tune to each other. Hallelujah. So when a chord is built, those notes harmonize, those notes fit together, those notes create something unusual. They, they, they release a response which is unusual. 4,017 unusual responses. In Matthew 18, verse 20, where two or three believers are gathered together, there am I in your midst. When two or three believers, wait a minute, let's slow down. We've read that so many times. Where two or three are gathered, 
That word gathered means assembled. It might not mean a believer from this denomination and this denomination and this denomination. It may not mean that. It means assembled. It could mean from this one, this one, this one, and this one. Would to God, it would mean that. What it does mean is that when believers are assembled, when a chord, a musical chord is built, these notes are assembled, they fit together. When you buy a gadget from the department store, it comes in multiple pieces. And on the label it says, some assembly required. So ladies read the instructions and men don't. And they ask the men, how does this go together? Anyway, I'm probably in enough trouble already. <laughs> Where two or three are gathered in my name, Every one of those chords, 4,017, has a name. And when that chord is played, it produces the result of that name. When two or three or more believers are assembled, assembled, in the name of Jesus, it will produce a result, a very unique result. Could be as varied as 4,017 results. Probably as many people as there are, as many believers as there are, as many assembled believers as there are, it could produce that many results. It, a musical string on a guitar, it creates a sound. When believers, as few as two or three, and one, we'll get to that later, when they make a sound in the name of Jesus, there's a result. Hallelujah. Being assembled is very important, very important. Hallelujah. In John 14, verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, when there's a bunch of instruments and they're all tuned together, let's say there's a hundred guitars and a hundred pianos and they're tuned together. If they play the key of C, Whatever they ask, it'll be done. If they play the key or the, the chord, <laughs> F chord, it'll be done. A, it'll be done. E, it'll be done. And there is no chord as pretty as E minor on a guitar. Whatever we ask, Whatever you ask in my name, it will be done. So if there's only one person praying, we know that if there's two or three, there is something supernatural about that harmony that can be accomplished. The end result of that harmony, if two or three or more, about one, who are you in harmony with? Simple. 
you're in harmony with the Bible. Somebody wrote this. You're in harmony with that person who wrote it, who was in harmony with the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. It's that simple. Pizza is ready. Hallelujah. This issue of unity was so important, so important to Jesus, that just hours before he was crucified, he drew attention to it. In John 17, starting at verse 20, uh, he, he concludes his prayer. He had earlier prayed for himself because he knew what was coming. He prayed for his current disciples. And in verse 20, he begins a prayer for those who will believe one day in their message. And in this prayer for those who will believe, which are today's believers, he includes something. I pray that they would be one. He didn't pray that for his current believers, but for the likes of today's Christian church, this was so important to Jesus that he prayed that we would be one. In verse 23, the word unity, that word literally means to shrink into one. Shrink into one. A simple example would be many grapes losing their, their personal identity and creating wine or juice. Unity, to shrink into one. In the Christian church worldwide, are there more Protestants or Catholics? Anybody want to guess? <laughs> Roman Catholicism comprises 50.1% of those who identify as Christian. Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which is Eastern Orthodox Catholicism, Russia and other Eastern European countries, they comprise 11.9% of Christianity. Protestants, 36.7. This in and of itself is not disturbing that there are so many factions. And if that hasn't rocked you, Within Protestantism, anybody want to guess how many denominations there are? Forty five thousand. Forty five thousand Protestant denominations. This does not have to spell disunity. Why? Why? In the early church, there was churches in many houses. They didn't meet like this in a big building. They met in homes. There was many homes, many homes. And today there's many denominations. It doesn't have to spell a catastrophe 
a bad day, disunity, it doesn't have to. And why should it? Why should it? The breakdown of Christianity is not in Catholicism versus Protestantism and all the different denominations within Protestantism. That's not the demise of Christianity. It's the lack of unity, the lack of unity. Uh, let's go back, I think, to that last scripture in John 17. I think that's where it was. In verse 23, I in them, you and me, may they be brought to complete unity. And here it is, to let the world know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me, to let the world know. The reason why the world got to know in those early days was because of unity. The many denominations that exist today, the many different church names that exist is not the problem. It's the lack of unity. Hallelujah. So let's bring this home. We're not responsible for what's happening out in the world. We can't fix what's happening out in the world. But we can fix what happens here at home. And we are responsible for home. I'm responsible for myself personally, and I'm responsible for the church family, just like you are. If you belong here, if this is home, you're responsible for yourself, and you're responsible for one another. And it's on the foundation of an amazing, amazing secret that has so much power and ability, unity, unity. And if we dare make a sound that harmonizes with someone else or someone else in the name of Jesus, we can expect a very unique and unusual response. We absolutely can. We can. When a musician is accomplished, when an orchestra is accomplished, and they start playing notes and chords with an expected result, they can just sound brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And so it is with the house of the Lord. When believers know, if I harmonize, if I can just harmonize in the name of Jesus, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant with results that are just indescribable, unbelievable, unbelievable. In Acts chapter 12, Peter is in jail. And this earthquake takes place and Peter is set free. And no, not the earthquake, that was later. This angel comes and boots him in the side, says, get up, and leads him outside. And Peter goes to the house of Mary, who was John Mark's mom. 
and he finds a bunch of people making a sound. They were unified. They were in harmony. They were assembled, making a sound. When Paul and Barnabas were sent out on Paul's first missionary journey, in Acts 13, verse 13, there was teachers and there was prophets in that church. And through the prophets, the Holy Spirit made a sound. <laughs> And they were sent out on the first missionary journey. Later, Paul and Silas are in jail. And in verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were worshiping God, making a sound. And the earthquake happened. Wow. Crazy stuff, crazy stuff. When there's a harmony, when different notes are gathered, when there's unity, when there's a coming together, when there's an assembly, In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Wow, wow, you can expect the unusual. You can. <laughs> what is our responsibility these many years later? Nothing really has changed as far as the original intent and plan, the instructions, nothing has changed. And so we simply take responsibility for myself and for the family. And we make our own sounds that harmonize. We make our own sounds. Men's prayer, amazing sounds. And we are pretty sure we have some amazing answers to prayer. Like, wow, amazing stuff. Sunday morning worship. You should have been in the prayer room if you weren't this morning. Whoa, there was a sound, most unusual. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Our encouragement this morning is unifying with the Holy Spirit, just being in harmony with him, being in harmony with one another, just choosing to lay aside whatever would cause disharmony. It's really that simple. It's not about do we all believe the same thing. For sure in this room we don't. That's not important. There's so much that we do believe in together. That's important. And we gather on those very basic fundamentals that probably worldwide everybody believes in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have great reason to be encouraged. Great reason to be encouraged. To make a sound, to be in harmony, and to expect the unusual. Hallelujah. We have a song we want to conclude with. It's the name of Jesus. I speak Jesus. I speak Jesus. Let's be very encouraged. We live in difficult days.
Let's be in harmony. Let's be in harmony. I speak Jesus. Amen. Speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every
peace within his presence I speak Jesus oh I speak Jesus oh I speak Jesus I speak Jesus the name of Jesus I speak Jesus the name of Jesus right now. Hallelujah. Jesus, we speak his name right now. Hallelujah. The name of Jesus over every situation, over every moment of our lives. We need you every minute of every day, Jesus. Hallelujah. We speak the name of Jesus, Jesus. This week when we speak the name of Jesus, we speak it out loud. Remember, you're in a body of assembled believers. We can expect amazing things to happen. This week, when you speak the name of Jesus out loud, we're assembled, we're together, we're responsible for each other. Hallelujah. We speak the name of Jesus in each one's life, in each one's trouble, in each one's uh, celebration. The name of Jesus over all this morning, over all. It's over all. His name is over all. It's over all. His name is over all. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Just be seated for a minute. I just feel we must use this opportunity this morning to speak Jesus over ourselves. What is happening in your heart, in your mind, in your mental health, in your body? Let's speak, Jesus, about that. Over your family. What's happening in the house where you are? What's happening in the place where you workplace? People around you. Let's speak, Jesus, over that. And I don't feel today that I've got this massive faith and say, okay, miracles are going to happen. But God is a God of miracles. And He is going to do that. This morning at home we were praying for our family overseas where they're not going the way God wants them to go. But let's speak Jesus over that, over Keremios, 
over us as a body. Let's speak Jesus and say, Jesus, let your will be done. Father, we come now to you in Jesus' name and we speak the name of Jesus over ourselves, over our family, over our children, over people who are not here, over the people in Keremios, over the people at work. We speak Jesus, that Jesus will break through in those hearts, that Jesus will show his um, reign, that he is the king of those hearts, that we will see Jesus doing miracles, doing amazing things that hasn't been seen before. The guy who was shouting there at the back, uh, that's the guy that we're praying for. We've been praying for him this week as well. And we're going to see, God, that you are doing what you promised you do. Your word will not return empty. We trust you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are going to do more than what we can pray or think. Because you are God Almighty. Not because of that we're so good or whatever, but because you are thank you that we're going to see it. We're going to see you doing amazing things in Keremios, in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We speak Jesus this week. We'll speak Jesus this week. Everybody say, we'll speak Jesus this week. We'll speak Jesus this week. We'll speak Jesus this week. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.